In Europe, at the beginning of the 16th century, the winds of change came blowing from the southern nations such as Spain, or Italy, more precisely Venice or Florence. They brought radical changes in the arts, the sciences, and a new outlook to eating habits. The Renaissance swept away age-old beliefs. The new world, America, was now within reach of the caravels, small three-masted Spanish and Portuguese sailing ships, while the rest of Europe erupted into religious conflicts between Protestants and Catholics, even at the table. Ironically, the period saw the invention of the first rules of civilized etiquette. Thanks to Gutenberg and his printing press, table manners and recipes could be published and become part of all good households. The banks of the Loire River and the elegant chateaus that dominate the riverfront. We can imagine times past with Francois I, King of France, offering Clos Lucet, his manor house, as a welcoming present to Leonardo da Vinci. The residence was just a stone's throw from the king's palatial chateau d'Amboise. It is a beautiful end to an afternoon in the year 1517. Leonardo would be enjoying these conditions to discuss new projects with Pacello, the landscape designer. Leonardo wanted to continue the gardens of Clos Lucet to the royal gardens of Amboise Chateau, thus maintaining close ties with his friend and patron. Leonardo knows his days are counted. He quickly draws a plan. He has just finished a new codex of anatomy. He will present it the next day to monks from Milan who are still baffled by the enigmatic painting of the Last Supper. Leonardo, now master of Clos Lucet, is always at work. He is also an Epicurean. He has just entered a quotation in his notebook. Happiness is to be found where one finds good wine. Master of charm, Leonardo lords the soft, velvety wines of the Loire region. He promises a compatriot, his guest to dinner, this evening, that the meal will be refined with good wine, together with pleasant company. Today, in the kitchen of Clos Lucet, the evening feast is being prepared. Master Chef Sauzin, a revered specialist of historical recipes of France, in particular haute cuisine from the Navarre region, oversees the lighting of the fire in the large chimney, as was done when King Francois I came to dine in private with Da Vinci. During the Renaissance, chateau kitchens became more spacious and well lit. Chimneys were also rebuilt and enlarged for cooking purposes and new techniques of simmering dishes. Spits were still extremely rare, but the handles of pots and pans became longer, improving the comfort of grill chefs. The cooking methods used in the Middle Ages are still employed. We still crush various spices to add to our preparation. Fowl, whether wild or farm produced, is still considered a noble dish. There had been no real revolution in taste. Sweet and salted dishes were still present at Renaissance tables. But as from the beginning of the 16th century, the art of presenting dishes, of preparing new delicacies, and a code of table manners entered a new era of innovation. The subjects of the King of France made real progress in eating habits, thanks to the Renaissance. Well before them, however, in Florence, Lorenzo de' Medici became Lorenzo the Splendid at his table. In 
opulent northern Italy, elegance and refinement crowned repasts some 60 years before the rest of Europe caught on. It all started in Florence, Leonardo's home city. This new form of social behavior began in the court of the de' Medici family. For the first time, an eating accessory, together with a flat plate, came into use, breaking with the medieval tradition when diners ate out of bowls or on eating boards with their hands. Eating from a plate became the model of etiquette, and Italy was the home of such inventions. This custom was adopted by other courts in Europe, but very much later on. Eating bowls were cast aside, and civilized eating habits took over. The first luxury of the Renaissance was the creation of a part of the residence reserved for meals. It became the dining room. Prepared by servants, the dining table became a spectacle where diners closely observed the master of ceremonies, the cook. The cook's task was to taste every dish before being served. The scandal of the terrible Borgia family, together with great progress in preparing poisons, made prudence part of daily organization. While the cook remained watchful, guests seized on another great innovation, the furcina, the fork. The fork, with its two points, made the eating process more elegant and, in theory, healthier. The advent of the fork is a mystery. It may have originated from the Middle East or Catalonia in Spain. Historians are still debating on this subject fervently. But one thing is sure, the Florentines democratized the habit. The only proof we have to date is from a painting by Botticelli, commissioned by Lorenzo de' Medici. We can see that each guest is holding a fucina, a two-pronged fork. The fork is truly an invention of the 15th century. It inspired the development of table etiquette of the Renaissance. Further north in Europe, and a little later in time, towards 1540, an acclaimed author spends his days in moribund humour in La Divinière, his country house. Francois Rabelais, the great French author, dines scantily, no doubt using a fork, but alone. He is the author of Gargantua. Rabelais has yet again become the subject of controversy at the Sorbonne University in Paris with farcical literary style and a deep concern for humanism. Laughter is the spice of man, writes Rabelais, but the author doesn't have the heart to laugh. An ill wind blows across Europe, that of religious intolerance. Since 1520, Martin Luther has been preaching religious reform in Germany. He targets the clergy in Rome. He preaches self-purpose to practicing Christians. Now, Catholics and Protestants clash with texts in hand and also across the table. Martin Luther pleads for the abolition of days of fast and Lent. In the reformed provinces, eating interdictions are indeed abandoned. Eat, drink, and dress as you fit, wrote Luther. God is only concerned by how you observe his wishes and not by the way you eat and dress. In 
In Protestant society, Christians could eat what they deemed necessary. Days of fast were suppressed. People could eat meat all year long, but only for nourishment. Wine was permitted on condition that one did not drink to excess, for one's pleasure. In fact, a definite excess of pleasure was targeted, whereas Catholic ethics limited restriction of eating pleasures to days of fast. In the shade of their bell towers, Catholics are worried, not about the austerity of Protestants, but about a dangerous waft of freedom that originates from their own church. Good Catholics can now eat cheeses during days of fast. We refer to a buttered up Europe of the 15th century. The Catholic Church made rapid decisions to keep their community intact. And since butter, eggs, milk and dairy foods were a daily delight, the Vatican proved their tolerance with reformist practices. Alas, religious issues overran the question of eating habits. Theological confrontation led to political turmoil and the result was horrific. Paris, August 24th, 1572. Those who took the liberty of choice with the fast of Friday were massacred without pity. By order of Catherine de Medici, together with the blessing of Pope Gregory XIII, 3,000 Protestants were killed in one day by soldiers under the command of the Duke de Guise. The Christian world was divided by the wars of religion. They would considerably modify the political scene in Europe and, as a consequence, dining table mores. In the Europe of religious reform, treaties concerning liberalism with meat consumption proliferate. However, butchers sell less and less of their produce. Pleasure and meat consumption are no longer compatible. Another effect, fish, is no longer the obligatory food for days of fast. Fishing and fishmonger activities drop. So many Christians no longer needed to observe penitence. People still needed nourishment though, and varieties of fruits and vegetables are seen on tables. Carrots, turnips, cauliflowers, peas, cabbage, salads, parsnips, onions make up the new food palette in reformed but rather frugal Europe. In Catholic France, Rabelais finally receives authorization, no less than from the king, to be published. Rabelais' characters are grotesque geniuses of greed. There isn't a well-mannered gourmet to be found. In real life, there were many gourmets, however. They frequented libraries, searching for precious recipes in the very first cookbooks in history. <laughs> Thanks to the marvellous technique of Gutenberg with his printing press, recipes appeared in black and white. They instructed chefs in the art of gastronomy and also the principles of healthy eating inherited from the Middle Ages. But what was not written in these books, most often originating from Italy, was that master cooks became capricious when their recipes were not followed to the letter. In the first half of the Renaissance, most cookbooks were published in Italy, especially Honest Voluptuousness, one of the first to come off the printing press. This book was originally written in Latin by Platinus. It was in fact a guide to a healthy diet and in the principles of cooking. Recipes from this book spread across Europe, but in fact they were not Italian Renaissance recipes, they were the work of Master Martino, a Catalonian chef. Qui est un cuisinier catalan.
Most recipe books came from Tuscany, Umbria or Venetia. Italy was the benchmark for culture, especially since the arrival of Catherine de' Medici at the court of France. She impressed her society with the use of forks, Italian table manners, skilled cooks and their colazione, dishes served cold, decorated by varieties of fruit and vegetables. Sixteenth-century Italian cookery books contain many recipes for vegetable dishes. The extent of the use of vegetables was unique to Italian chefs. In no other books can we find the equivalent. This taste for vegetables increased throughout the Renaissance, and Italy was systematically the source of inspiration. Protestant Christians helped bring cabbages and onions to southern European kitchens. Aubergines and cucumbers, blessed by Catholics, were adopted by chefs in the north. The Italians exported their cookbooks and science of horticulture. In all of Europe, vegetable gardens became true laboratories. Methods of selection, crossbreeding, cutting and grafting led to the production of new varieties of vegetables in particular zucchinis and artichokes. The unpleasant thistle becomes a choice ingredient. The Renaissance painter Giuseppe Archimboldo incorporated a thistle in his portrait of a prince in his fantastic style painting, Summer. But for most people of the time, such exotic vegetables were still a luxury. The trend for fruit and vegetable dishes was a consequence of policies emanating from the pontificate. The meat was prescribed by the higher ranks of the clergy. Chefs at the Vatican had to invent new ways of consuming fruit and vegetables. And eventually, fruit and vegetables became the model food for the wealthier class. Such innovations remained accessible to the general public. Cardoons from southern Europe, for example. Their rusticity appealed to austere Protestants. A French agronomist of the late 16th century, Olivier de Serre, described the plant as being unpleasant. The root cannot be rid of its grossly sharp taste. Many Protestants fleeing persecutions found refuge in the Republic of Genoa. Baked cardoon root became the symbolic dish of Protestant resistance facing troops under the command of the Catholic Duke of Savoy. Fifteen thirty five, Pion Velay, France. The Cathedral of the Black Virgin has become a leading site for pilgrims. Camp followers and cooks are very busy chopping, then dicing meat, before the ingredients are to be sautéed. King Francois I is expected in person, followed by his sumptuous suite. The monarch has become a gourmet. Honouring him will not be easy. He is known to be fond of a new delicacy that has crossed the Alps, pasta. Pasta was made and imported from Sicily. Thanks to the Islamic civilization, well before Marco Polo brought back noodles from China. Pasta remained a luxury food. There was work to be done to produce good pasta. Initially, pasta was made from corn flour. All the preparation was done by hand. To make fine pasta, the cook needed a strong wrist and a great deal of patience. In the kitchens of Northern Europe, cooks improvised enriching pasta with cream and butter 
or egg yolk. And they didn't stop there. Pasta was often used to accompany boiled chicken. Then, soft spices were added, such as cinnamon. Meanwhile, in Genoa, Naples or Rome, noodles, gnocchi, tortellinis and lasagna were decreasingly worked by hand. The invention of mechanical presses allowed manufacturers of pasta to replace the dominance of bakers and to market pasta in great quantities. Thus, pasta was brought to the palates of diners in every republic and principality of the Italian peninsula. One major culinary detail was lacking. Cooks and kitchen boys at the time ignored the al dente quality. It was good taste in the Renaissance to boil macaroni for two hours and sometimes even make a dessert of them by incorporating sugar and cinnamon. The Renaissance witnessed great discoveries, such as America by Christopher Columbus. He dreamed of finding a new world and also fantastic spices. However, his successors became thirsty for gold. But botanists and merchants traveling with the fleets were more prosaic and searched for other treasures, such as beans, marrow, corn, pepper, tobacco and cocoa were discovered. Strangely enough, tomatoes and potatoes were scorn. Europeans would turn their noses up at these newcomers for almost two centuries. It is fascinating to learn which new produce imported from the Americas was considered a prestigious discovery and was rapidly integrated into European cooking. Such was the case with capsicum that dethroned pepper. It was dubbed a poor man's pepper. Corn also made an immediate impact. It accompanied turkey that became an esteemed dish in the courts of Italy during the early years of the 16th century. It was an age of immensely successful merchants, true ambassadors of a new world. The greater world was slowly being seen as being round. Caravels, galleons and Dutch galliots crossed the oceans, their holds filled with new treasures. When they set out again towards the Americas, they transported corn, flax, barley and grapevine shoots. Such marine trade ensured the survival of the first colonists and the fortune of merchants. Arriving also from the New World, still called the Indies, the plump India hen began its reign as master of poultry farms of the Renaissance. It adapted wondrously to the farms and fields of Europe. It was fattened with corn from the first plantations in the old continent. Plump, tasty and cheap, the India hen was brought into politics at the end of the 16th century. In France, Henry IV and his good minister, Sully, issued a decree that their subjects should have the right to eat boiled fowl each Sunday. With fowl so inexpensive, the economy of the kingdom could not possibly be ruined, and poultry finally became very popular. In an inn on the outskirts of Amboise in France, Renaissance enthusiasts still sing homages to the good king who democratized poultry. <laughs> However, Henry IV was scorned by his wealthier subjects. They blamed him for making poultry too popular and thus condemned the food as being vulgar. No matter, for peasants and the emerging middle class, Henri's Prime Minister, Sully, managed internal affairs well and made it possible to install a strong Sunday eating tradition. Protestants and Catholics could sit at the table together. Whether boiled, roasted on a spit, 
the India hen, later to take the name of turkey, remained the most wonderful gift the new world has to offer the old world, as claimed by the famous gastronomist Briat Savarin three centuries later. However, for the rest of the week in rural homes, the eating mode was much more frugal. Bread remained the staple food. The haymaking and harvesting periods were the most significant feasting period of the year for peasants. Cereals such as wheat or rye were grown to make bread. Buckwheat, barley and oats were used to nourish livestock. If the harvests of hay and corn were good, there would at least be enough milk and bread as a result to get through autumn and winter. The consumption of fresh milk was however reserved for people in convalescence. Dairy produce such as curdled milk or cheese was generally consumed. The most popular cheeses of the 16th century in Europe were French Roquefort blue cheese, Dutch Gouda or Edam or Italian Parmesan. We return to Clos Lucé, where the melody of lutes accompanies the call to dinner. Humble peasants could not possibly imagine the array of luxury dishes on this table. The Tuscan master of the house likes to impress. He is very sensitive to culinary tendencies. Today, he has requested an olla podrida. The recipe is of Spanish influence. Cooks from Lombardy and Genoa made a monument of this dish. It was a complete meal in itself and perfectly espoused the growing passion for fruit and vegetable dishes. In the Renaissance, table etiquette was very sophisticated. One had to handle a fork elegantly, know how to use flattery in excess, master the art of simpering, then daring to indulge in a strange vogue, the hopping dance called tourdillon. Another manner of dazzling guests was to serve succulent desserts. We can imagine Leonardo making fun of the French, who were a little rustic when it came to the art of serving fruits, poached in mature Touraine wine, served in a plate lined with sugar. Sugarloaf was sold by apothecaries in the previous century and was rare, expensive, and even sold for cures. Now they were centerpieces, trophies for banquets during the Renaissance. They symbolized good taste in culinary matters. Sugarloaf made sweetening with honey become a thing of the past. Arriving in ever greater quantities directly by sea from North Africa and the Antilles, sugar invaded Renaissance tables abundantly. We are sure that sugar was greatly used during the Renaissance. We have many references indicating extensive use of sugar in English and Italian society. In France, however, the cooking was still dominated by an acid taste. The French converted to sugar later. Renaissance recipes abound with recipes including sugar, about 60% of recipes in fact. Besides its use as an ingredient, sugar was also extensively used to decorate dishes. Tables were decorated with statues made out of sugar. In Florence, Piero Tarca was a renowned sculptor of such works. Mechanical presses were used to make these statues. Artisans opened shops to restore the statues for future banquets. Sugar became the new symbol of wealth and power. 
it also fired the imagination of creative cooks in Venice. For Scari Palace Venice, an evening in 1574. To honor his guest, Henry III, King of France, the Doge of Venice, has decided to draw up a table where all the crockery is made out of sugar. Goblets, plates, carafes, and of course, the dishes making up the dinner are made out of sugar that has been spun. Even the ornamented gondolas used to present the latest fad, drage, sugar, coated nuts and fruit, are made from sugar. The powerful Republic of Venice favors the fine arts, especially table art. The Mannerist painter, Veronese, knew how to seize the moment for eternity. His work, hung in the Louvre Museum, attracts strange admirers. This painting, The Wedding at Cana, is a fabulous testimony. Society is seized as a whole. Look at the U-shaped table. It is immense. If you look closer, you can see a profusion of objects in sugar on the table. It is clear that this is an orgy of sugar. It's also clear that the people present intend to indulge. I interpret the scene as if the diners were just wetting their appetite with the delicacies. Abounding in jams, candied fruit, dragées, Renaissance tables were reveries of sweetness. There were often a lack of table glasses. Sharing of drinking glasses was admitted, but not delicacies. Veronese is represented as a musician in the foreground dressed in white. He is concentrating on music as if to say, one does not jest with the desire for sugar. If you look a little more closely, you can see at the edge of the table a small box, which is probably made of wood. Inside there is a cotignac, a confection made of quinces, then covered in sugar. You had a sweet confection that was sweetened again. You really had to like sugar to eat such concoctions. Since it was the fashion, there was no problem. In the kitchens of Clos Lucet, as in all the noble houses of Europe, Master Chef Sauzin keeps to this fashion. This evening, as a follow-up to his famous pears in syrup, he prepares other sweetened delights, such as his green prune tart, accompanied by his famous coutignac, the confection of quinces, but only he knows how to prepare. After having reduced wild quinces to a juice with sugar after three hours simmering, so that the sugar blends with the savour of the fruit, he tosses in a generous amount of ground ginger. Once the juice cools, it will be transferred to a small pinewood box prior to serving. In Northern Europe, at the beginning of the 16th century, the delicacies and refinements of Italian cooking were yet to be as largely adopted as they had been in France. In Flanders, for example, certain medieval practices in sweetened delicacies persisted. No forks were used, no plates either. People ate with their fingers, but of the right hand and an eating board. The great humanist Erasmus lived in this old house in Anderlecht. The small details of Renaissance delights have been conserved. Erasmus was the first to codify the art of table manners. In his writing on the education of children, he carefully observed how children behaved at the table, and he noted,
Shifting their body on a chair or balancing from one buttock to the other is clearly the attitude of someone who wishes to release wind or who is at least making an effort to. In a more didactic way, he also clarified rules of propriety. Posing an elbow or both on the table is excusable only for an old man or a sick man. Licking any sugar at the bottom of a plate is to act like a cat, not as a human being. This major figure of Christian humanism left nothing to random. Erasmus brings to his time the courtesy. He wants that boys have manners because before they were mid in middle age, they were just at time. They were eating with their hands. They were running around. They were not, often not washing their hands. Very important for Erasmus to wash their hands, to clean their nails, because he wanted a very pure heart to eat, but also a very pure, uh, physically pure hands, etc. He had a very weak stomach, which uh, makes that he had to be very careful what he was eating and what he was touching and what he was drinking and so on. And so it was really something which goes together with his health. For example, he travels a lot around Europe and he has a lot of critics on the very dirty uh, rooms where he has to sleep, the beds which are not clean. Uh, and he wanted that little boys did it different with his little book. This book of precepts was written at the end of Erasmus' life. It is filled with principles of precautions, those of a person whose health is fragile and who's suffering from dysentery. Despite his sufferings, Erasmus can still joke about his Lutheran stomach and his Christian spirit. Among his codes on behavior are to be found a philosophy of food. For Erasmus, the table is a place to purify, yes, certainly. Not only the heart, but everything, the ideas, the heart. Um, so Erasmus had pleasure in, at the table, in only already in the fact that he was around the table with friends. That was very, very important for him. And he has written about it. He has written in his colloquia, small, those, those small dialogues, that he wanted friends around him. He had to discuss with them, uh, do some philosophy. And then between the, the large dialogues, they could eat a little bit fresh things coming out from the garden. For example, in one of his um, dialogues, the godly feast, there we have the two words very important for Erasmus. You have the feast because you are eating with friends, but you have also the godly. This means he's very religious and um, as I told before, he wanted to be clean, not only the hands had to be clean, but also the heart. So you had to be really a very pure person by the education. In Northern Europe, the reform had many followers, despite an ascetic doctrine. In Southern Europe, such rigors and level-headedness around the table were mocked. In his Opera dell'arte del cucinare, the very first art of cooking study edited in Europe, Bartolomeo Scappi remained faithful to the precepts of his master, the pitiless Pope Pius V. Scappi imported prohibited ideas and pleasures to the kitchen. Scappi is quite a well-known figure. He was also a writer. His book of kitchen rules became famous and he was claimed to be one of the great cooks of the Renaissance. But I have to say there was another very significant cook at the time of the Renaissance. Maestro Martini di Rossi was probably the one who influenced cooking tendencies of the Renaissance. Unlike Maestro de Rossi, Scappi was the first to plan feasting on a large scale and to exceed the borders of the imagination. He wrote about his preparations French style, German style or Spanish style. He even wrote details of Moorish dish with semolina as a base. It was called couscous. The work of Scappi was also adorned by superb engravings. He reviewed every innovation in kitchen utensils, deeming them essential tools to preserving the prestige of cooks.
In the kitchen of Clos Lucet, master cook Souza could have sought inspiration from his mentor, Master Scappi, to treat the noble assembly to a sumptuous meal. To compose such a dinner again, Souza would most probably prepare zucchini, lasagne, turkey quenelles, or foie gras with spiced bread and bitter orange jam. Finally, he will opt for simplicity. Voluptuous, tender, stewed veal with lemons and fresh basil, in the manner of Scappi. After having finely sliced the veal cutlets, the assistant cooks finely chop a bouquet of basil. Sosa will saute the cutlets in olive oil in a frying pan. Once the veal turns white, Sosa will deglaze the cutlets with the juice of four lemons without drowning the dish and douse it with a medium sweet claret from the Loire region. At the end of the simmering phase, Sauzanne pours a generous pinch of sugar to accentuate the taste. Now, just prior to the moment when the basil exhales its aroma, it is time to add a mixture of ground cloves, ginger and pepper. Sosa, as Scappi had prescribed, did indeed win his personal wager. The first duty of a cook is to conform with the tastes and character of the prince to whom he serves. A cook must always consider the mood of his master above all. Da Vinci and Francois I would surely have congratulated him. Naissant's culinary delights orchestrated by Scappi were always appreciated in Italy, in particular in Alberetta. This small paradise of a town dominating the plain of Po now boasts Signore Gualtierio Marchesi as master chef. He has become the first transalpine master cook to receive three stars. He draws his inspiration from the print press, the arts, and very often from historical anecdotes. What impresses me in Scappi's work is its modernity, the manner of considering cooking. Like him, I have a natural passion for good produce. I find it necessary to optimize the quality and taste of good produce when expressing myself through my cooking. I share Scappi's idea of the art of cooking, separate the elements making up a dish to enhance the appreciation of the food being eaten. A good fillet, a piece of meat, a fish cooked to perfection is the way of honoring their value. Then you must accompany these foods with contrasting elements so that they stimulate taste and savor. Formidable Scapi. In Alberetta, the legacy of the august ancestor of haute cuisine lives on, as can be seen by the menus. Take his foie gras, for example. Scappi resuscitated the method from antiquity. It had been forgotten during the Middle Ages. But Marchese has reinvented the recipe. He has combined the process with a recipe for quail from the Pope's kitchens at the time of the Renaissance. Foie gras with quail, a sublime procession of figs, sliced prime zucchini and mustard. The association between quail and fruit puree with mustard 
typical of the Renaissance period, produced a sweet and tangy savour. The contrast between the silky, fatty savour of foie gras and truffle and subtle bite of mustard tops all savours for a fine note. But the master cooks of the Pope's court, and Scappi, the master cook of Alboreta, had a different idea of presentation. Scappi was also a sculptor at heart. He impressed by creating sublime layers of foie gras. Marchese prefers flattering presentations. He marries decoration with abstraction. Such as his very famous risotto, a hint of cheese to accompany the subtlety of saffron. Marchese associates culinary history with the art of the painter Casimir Malevich. There is a very strong connection with the Renaissance. Gold was used to decorate fine dishes. Saffron was a condiment that was cultivated in Italy in Abruzzi and Marchese. Rice, gold and saffron was also used as an artistic expression. It is like harmony in a musical piece, as musicians say when they compose. It is in fact an embellishment to a dish. I always say, amaze your diners by simplicity. A suggestion of Malevich's painting, a yellow square on a yellow background. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the tables of Europe would forget the greedy characters of Rabelais, the modernization of Erasmus, or the organized genius of Scarpi. Great refinement was called for, supreme luxury and elegance of etiquette. This period would put aside spices. Associations of food in a near natural state were revered, as was early produce, together with a passion for chocolate. But Europe would also encounter terrible famines. Proud master cooks in the kitchens of great residences would also have to face misery during the century of enlightenment.